So thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the conference. I've got half an hour. It's a little bit less than I would have liked, but let's see what we can do with that. So the monopole clutch, evidence of monopole-like structures and their action in cold transmutation of nuclei. Uh, what you have there is a libation disk. Uh, it is from Egypt, uh, 3,100 BC, so nearly 5,000 years ago. <clears throat> the two bent arms that frame the three sides of the dish are read car and the word for spirit in ancient Egyptian. The loop and the knot are read ank, meaning life or to live. The combination uh, could be interpreted as a phrase, life to thy spirit. And that is the uh, text that's on the Metropolitan website um, where the image was taken from. Now, <clears throat> this is a libation disc, so you'd put water in it and you would pour it over uh, in something or someone in a um, ceremony, and it's really for the sort of pharaohs and so forth. Um, and the idea of the ank is that from the, the loop down, uh, from the loop down, this symbol represents the key to all hidden knowledge. And uh, it, it, it comes from flat all the way down to curved in various implementations. And uh, it is just interesting that proportions nearly exactly match the type of uh, monopoles that have been observed, uh, at least in their 2D slice uh, by many authors. And uh, if you actually look at the lower section where material appears to be going in or out, um, there is a change in the uh, uh, density of that, which is, corresponds very accurately to the the change in depth of the water as it would come out of the pouring section. I have a CIA document uh, that I came across uh, that was released on CIA archives at, in January 2017. Uh, it was actually from uh, Rabachaya Tribuna, you might know it better than I do, and it was from a news article on 16th of June 1992. And uh, a couple of points on this, it was reported that so-called cold fusion was discovered in the United States. It could not be explained, but they were trying to find the feet because they were trying to find the features of fusion reactors where they couldn't be found. Um, and then he goes on to ask, you know, what, what is it, the technology that you're using? And he says, well, it's not fusion, fission or energy from the vacuum. We are dealing with a phase transition, extracting the inner energy of matter. And it can be extracted not from water, uh, but from, say, metal. Uh, the electron accelerator connected to the circuit turns the converter into a space propulsor. Using it, one can reach Alpha Centauri and return back to Earth in 12 years. The energy concealed in one kilogram of iron is quite sufficient for interstellar journey. Okay, so <clears throat> this, at the time in 1992 when this was published, I actually visited a switchgear conference and next door there were a lot of Russian scientists that had lost their funding and they were... Um, they were receiving, uh, they were trying to sell their incredible, incredible technology. And I had a pleasure of meeting them. And so I have in the context of my mind, the, the genuine desire for people to share their information at that time in 1992, which I experienced firsthand. And this document that I first came across uh, uh, in 2017. And this really started a, a change in my thinking about what could be going on. Now, I have talked about this in other presentations, uh, but in, uh, I think in 2003, uh, Leonard Oretzkov of the Fondation de Broglie um, did an experiment where he essentially, in my view, proved the fact that, there, that strange radiation uh, has a, a polar, uh, uh, you know, north and south pole to it. And he used a, a, some iron 57 at uh, 70 centimeters away from the exploding metal foils. And he had one piece of iron 57 with a north uh, pole attached to the back of it and another one uh, in a different location with the south pole. And he found that <clears throat> uh, uh, he was able to change the, the fine, uh, super fine magnetic field. Uh, in the case of north, it increased it and south, it decreased it uh, by a similar amount uh, and com compared to the um, uh, the, the control. And so for, for me, th this, this shows that, it, that there are uh, magnetic monopoles, obviously the north and south, and that uh, they can be captured by uh, ferromagnetic materials. And this is all back in 2003. Um, then there's this paper uh, uh, from 1983 by John G. Kramer at the Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics. I've given the link there. 
And he says, when a proton meets a monopole, consider that when, what will happen if a massive monopole comes very close to a proton, attracted perhaps by the small magnetic dipole field, which every proton has. The quarks within the proton would have a reasonable probability of encountering the core region of the monopole. And when this happens, the quarks are very likely to forget their identity and be changed to some other flavor of quark or lepton. If this happens, proton decay becomes a near certainty. But the monopole, the cause of it all, is unaffected. It is still stuck with the surplus of magnetic flux, so it cannot participate in the decay process. I won't continue there, but essentially uh, this catalyzes decay. Now, the first sign that I had of anything polar going on in Lena was when I had an opportunity to uh, run the Nova reactor, which is a microwave reactor. You put uh, charcoal in it, uh, it's a 2.45 gigahertz uh, um, magnetron in their standard one from a microwave, but overdriven. And this produced uh, two different pieces of material on the left, non-magnetic, on the right, magnetic, magnetically separated. And we looked at that under the SEM um, uh, with EDS. And <clears throat> we found the typical sort of George Oshawa reaction products in, in that material here. So it, interestingly, it had these highly magnetic spheres. You can see them connecting to each other there. And uh, all of the standard sort of George Oshawa reaction products were um, present. And actually, this is most of the elements in your body. So it's just interesting in its own right. Now, one thing, uh, and I've got it here, you can see the, the top right spectrum one uh, is mostly uh, sort of silicon oxide. And given the fact that it was in a quartz uh, uh, vibration sort of uh, tuned uh, vessel, um, it could have come from that. But the spectrum two uh, is mostly iron. Uh, in fact, it's like um, uh, hematite, uh, highly magnetic uh, material. But uh, I don't know if you can notice, but uh, uh, on the um, uh, big one and the small one below that, there are kind of two spots, and it's actually more clear if you look at it here, uh, where I'm showing the carbon and the oxygen. And there's a hole on one side, it, it's right on, on the big sphere, and it's, it's a lump on the left side of the big sphere. So it's like uh, got two eyes. And the one at the bottom has a kind of like hole on one side and, and a lump on the other, and it's literally like a carbon sphere. And when I looked at this, I didn't really think too much of it. Um, however, it kind of stuck in my mind that maybe there is some sort of poles that have got stuck to this uh, and they were throwing out material. And, and what I found over the last three years is that it doesn't matter which Lena system you look at, it seems to rip matter apart into uh, alpha uh, clusters and it, it produces alpha conjugate nuclei. Um, and if, if, if uh, uh, there's any kind of leftover or it's kind of dying down, it seems to just dump a lot of carbon, which is tri-alpha out. And so the idea that this has a, a sphere of carbon in one of its eyes uh, is not surprising to me. So uh, here we go. Uh, and this is uh, the, um, I have a, is it gonna play here? Yes. Okay, so the, the top one has aluminium, magnesium, and silicon. And of course, these are either side of uh, um, aluminium, silicon being one side and magnesium the other. Anyway, um, th this just got me onto the thinking about could monopoles uh, be involved? Now, um, the low shack monopole is the, the, the type of monopole that uh, Rydzkev is uh, wedded to. Uh, therefore, this monopole may be considered magnetically excited neutrino. Um, and it goes on, uh, it is possible that such monopoles have not only electromagnetic, but weak interactions. It is possible to produce monopoles in weak uh, reactions instead of neutrinos. Now, one, one uh, school of thought is that th these are uh, one and the same thing. Uh, finally, this leads to the hypothesis that these monopoles could play a role in magnetic activity of the sun, in particular the sunspots. Now, uh, one experiment I've worked with a lot over the last few years is the lion experiment. And inside the lion experiment, it has an, an industrial diamonds embedded into an industrial diamond abrasive uh, like this uh, here. It's a 3M, 3M diapad. I don't know if you can see that. I'm waving in front of the camera. Um, 
Uh, anyway, um, these uh, um, are in the core, having been heated and, and uh, uh, dunked in deuterium. The interesting thing is that each reactor has a two and a half inch uh, iron bolt in it. And uh, uh, for, for me, this is interesting because it would allow a buildup of magnetic charge at the end of the bolt, which is right next to the fuel, up to the iron curie point, which is 769 degrees C. And in the nickel, in the reactor, that only goes up to 353 degrees. So whereas there was a collection of magnetic uh, monopoles by the iron 57, by Ritzkev in 2002, 2003, um, uh, outside of the reactor, this is uh, trying to collect the... Uh, monopoles that are produced um, right in the core of the reactor. And this could explain why, uh, if you look at the area on the center uh, of this slide, you can see that there's, uh, the copper is not melted. That's because half of that is outside of the reactor and part of that's in, in, in the solenoid heater coil. But the bolt actually extends down to where it starts to become gray. And that's where you get these very, very interesting structures. These uh, uh, chiral, uh, I, I would call them uh, the left and right mag magnetic monopoles. And you can see them here um, where we have these uh, uh, mirrored uh, triangles here in different locations. And so what, I, what I'm saying is that th th there's a, a concentration of magnetic monopoles both in the nickel area and in the, um, and in, in the end of the bolt. Again, this is a, a little bit further down, so the, so the bolt is extending down here to uh, just, just around about where that red uh, circle is. And you have these, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back. How, how can I go back? Um, you have these uh, north-south uh, uh, structures, which I've uh, discussed before uh, over this area in the reactor. And it is also in this area, just, just where the crack uh, in the copper oxide is up here, that we see these absolutely beautiful, beautiful strange radiation individual tracks. And for me, these are the equivalent of uh, the birdies or the mushroom, um, uh, as uh, uh, Perovzchikov says uh, in his paper. Uh, uh, but they're in different orientations as it's going down the zigzag. Okay, so what I did was I, I took the, uh, um, the Bogdanovich uh, I image of one of these uh, birdies and I did some contrast adjust to try and find out where the, 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 the most dense part of the, the structure is. And I created a, 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 th a kind of 3D structure, of, like an inferred uh, field structure of what that is. Um, and uh, the, the disc I have there, the, the torus in, in the middle is, uh, in my view, uh, potentially what's creating this field structure. And then I'm overlaying that on uh, these um, uh, collections of um, uh, monopoles, I believe have got tracked on the inside of the quartz in the Lion reactor. And I show here, um, that there is, uh, when you have the same one, uh, you, you have field interference and you get uh, material swept around and brushed off to the side, material swept around and brushed off to the side, material swept around, swept around and round. And then there's three down the bottom here, la 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 la. And then in between these ones, when they're the same, because they're kind of going in different directions, you actually have these areas that are unaffected. Now, depending on the pole, and I'm not entirely certain which one's which, uh, if you have one pole, you actually have a hole in the center. The material is not affected. If you have the opposite pole, you still have the circle around the outside, but you have an intense uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, white area where material, so one is kind of like sucking the material out, but it's, it's not really so intense in the center. And the other one's ramming it into the surface. So here's some close up on, on uh, these uh, potentially structures that, 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 that might be causing this. So you can see the one on the left, the material is sweeping around either this way. Uh, and on, on this one, it's actually like it's ejecting something out and there's one at slightly at a different angle. Now I, I've shown uh, this before and these are uh, two structures. Uh, it's the same structure rather on another uh, line reactor. And one is uh, overlaying the other. And this is really 
a, a kind of magneto hydrodynamic structure as is this. Um, and uh, I, the reason I'm saying this is uh, because of a paper that I will come to at the end. But the wire appeared to have trapped this structure and it's only on the outside of the reactor. And on the top of the wire, you can see a buildup of material. And in fact, that material is only on the top side of that piece of wire. And it looks like this, thank you to Magic Sound Labs. On the left, you can see the buildup of the material and I've zoomed in closer uh, on, on the right. And that is these series of crystals here that have been deposited on the top of that wire. Now, um, it is a, a, a Cantal wire. So you've got aluminium and a very small amount of silicon, uh, chrome and, and iron in there, but there shouldn't be the calcium there. And there's this very, very high concentration of carbon, which should, shouldn't be in there. And so it's depositing these crystals at this top. And so what I'm suggesting is that you have these uh, flux uh, loops, which then uh, join up and uh, shift material. Now there's an old MIT video down the left here, and you can see how the uh, magneto hydrodynamics of this uh, interact, uh, leaving the structure. So I've actually got both structures there. I've got the, the one on the outside of the quartz, and you can see that the internal white area matches the half the distance between them. And the overall area uh, uh, matches the, the larger radius, which is the not the half distance, but the distance between the two points. Now, <clears throat> this is a direct connection to uh, um, ferromagnetic materials. Uh, in the 2006 paper here, again, uh, by uh, Filipov and Arutskov, uh, they were looking at the possible magnetic mechanism of shortening the runway of the IBM K1000 reactor at Chernobyl. And this for me um, is a very interesting paper because it talks about the ability of these magnetic monopoles to bind to the oxygen nucleus. And it talks about how this made these magnetic currents in the pipes and caused the pipes to rip off the wall and, and eventually lead to the destruction of uh, the reactor. So it says that theory is paramagnetic nuclei can capture magnetic charge and that these stimulate nuclear reactions. A study of the elemental composition of the post-accident fragments of graphite blocks from the fourth unit of the power plant, considerable islets of aluminium, silicon, sodium, and uranium were found within the graphite debt, although it is well known that highly pure graphite is used in the, the reactors for the moderation blocks. A number of eyewitnesses, including members of the government commission, I've noticed that the glow observed the ruin above the ruined reactors uh, during the first days after the accident was unnaturally colored. And he's accounting um, this effect due to monopoles. So what I've done on the MFMP, uh, along with Philip Power, where uh, we've developed this thing at nanosoft.co.nz, where you can uh, real time uh, uh, run both uh, specific and cascade reactions using the Parkamov reaction tables, which we've extended in many ways. And recently we've extended it with the, the, uh, uh, the uh, NMR uh, 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 data for uh, the elements. And we've also, for the magnetic type here, so you can see for erbium, you've got this very high magnetic volume uh, um, figure on the right hand corner. Now, how does this relate to uh, water and water being able to capture magnetic monopoles and so forth? Well. Uh, I want to talk about a Mars gas. Um, uh, during my time in Japan last year, I proved that the vibrator plates used in a Mars gas were producing ultrasonic frequencies and that cavitation uh, uh, was being uh, also uh, initiated. And that this was leading to the production of strange radiation tracks. And we actually observed classic strange radiation tracks coming out of the center of cavitation spot. Uh, and that was all within the first day. The exotic vacuum object, strange radiation magnetic monopoles is binding to both the paramagnetic oxygen in the water and oxygen itself, potentially playing an important role in Amasa gas clusters that also encapsulate and stabilize atomic hydrogen. So they've done analysis and they found these uh, various cluster sizes of uh, Amasa gas and the fact that, it, that somehow that contains atomic hydrogen in there in a stabilized form. When burnt, the exotic vacuum object, strange radiation magnetic monopoles is released by, uh, as by the laser excitement in the work of Perozchikov. So essentially, like, like he uh, exposes with a, with a 0.5 Tesla field, 
water to uh, sunlight. Uh, that is how the story goes, whether it's coming from sunlight, I don't know. But anyway, he then uses a laser to release these uh, same uh, birdies that are observed by uh, um, Bogdanovich and Shishkin et al. and by myself in physical form in the Lion reactor. Strange radiation aggregates uh, in materials based on their magnetic properties and above thresholds causes lattice failure, rapid oxidization and transmutation. So this is a 10 yen coin that was exposed to a Mars gas. And there's this structure here, um, which is uh, very similar to Alto University's uh, concept of a uh, magnetic monopole, at least part way through uh, its formation. And this structure, I analyzed the right hand side, the more yellowy section of that, where you can see those little kind of cobblestones as I call them. And in there, there were these uh, little balls, these little plasmoids that had moved around on that uh, surface. And they had effectively uh, taken uh, oxygen and uh, fused it to uh, uh, sulfur. And so um, uh, it would appear that it is doing Lena, it's Lena in a can. And uh, another point on that uh, same uh, uh, coin you can see in the, in the top center there there's a, a classic sort of a uh, disc that looks very much like those that which you've observed in Matsumoto's work and other researchers and so I've taken the structure here and uh, if you can imagine this is part the way through a surface revealing the uh, edge here uh, then we have this particular configuration here where <clears throat> that ring the, the, the structure is coming in and it's actually changing uh, or removing the material. Now, it would seem that, that, that copper, it's obviously highly conductive. Uh, it, it, both isotopes have an NMR moment quite high um, and it is uh, uh, um, uh, of the right magnetic uh, state. It seems that, that c c copper basically disappears and transmutes readily uh, with this technology. However, the zinc uh, is uh, left behind, as it were. So a very large amount of this coin disappeared, and it seems to be mostly the copper that's disappeared, and it leaves a lot of the zinc left over. But you can see in the dome, of, if, if we're to assume that the magnetic monopole did this it, with its field structure or whatever, it kind of left this dome uh, um, in, in, in the material. So this is just a bit of uh, interest here. Now, um, in the case of the Joseph Papeb engine, uh, changing tax here, the exotic vacuum objects are initially generated by Tesla-based cathode ray pro uh, processor and in situ using corona discharge or radioisotope. And a portion of these EVOs are destroyed in the spark discharge, releasing a wide band of electron energies that cascade ionize the penning mixture of noble gases, with each gas taking its turn in absorbing incoming uh, electron uh, electrons, residual EVOs are grown in this plasmatic state. Toroidal shaped cylinder head, I'm going to skip on from that. Uh, essentially, there was an accident. Uh, there was a very thin wire that was attached to the wall. And in infinite energy, it just says it's not sufficient to be able to uh, contend with this uh, power to drive this device. Um, I believe that this was a ground drain for excess EVOs. Now, we all know lightning likes to go to ground and, uh, and ball lightning likes to find its wet path to ground. And I believe that this thin wire was actually to stabilize the reactor to prevent uh, exotic vacuum objects or monopoles building up in the metal structures. Um, when the wire was removed and uh, Feynman decided to hold on to it, um, it started to build up to a threshold. Now, in the case of aluminium, aluminium softens. In fact, in, in John Hutchison's work, uh, one of his colleagues was able to put his hand and, and leave fingerprints in aluminium uh, 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 by displacing it with the, just the pressure of his finger. So aluminium is softened, but metal, uh, it, such as iron, gets to a point where it just, it just immediately cracks. Uh, it gets to a point where it, it, it yields uh, instantaneously. And so I believe that the, the, the actual cylinder, the aluminium cylinder block, let's assume it was that, this, the, the cylinder in there, the piston head rather, uh, was aluminium. It became basically like a liquid and the actual, the, the engine block, the, 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 the head, uh, cracked. And Feynman, in his own account of it, this is only in Feynman's own account, he says that a cone of silvery uniform stuff shot out and turned to smoke. 
Uh, and so this thing exploded, but a, a silvery blob came out and then turned to this uh, smoke. And I believe that that was instant oxidization of the blob of what was formerly the PAP engine cylinder. <clears throat> so um, in each of these cases, I believe these magnetic monopoles were building up and it's something to consider for safety. In the case of Yule Brown radiation remediation, uh, and obviously Brown's gas has similarities with Omar's gas, um, the most startling claim by the inventor in the press is that the gas produced hit, uh, in his process can reduce nuclear and toxic waste to harmless carbon. This has been observed over and over again. Matsumoto in 2001, 2002 in fusion technology said, whatever he puts into his reactors, most of what comes out, it doesn't matter what nucleons you put in, is carbon. I believe this is in a low pressure situation uh, where it's not driven too hard, but uh, it certainly matches my own observation. 1991-92, using a slice of radioactive americium, Brown melted it together on a brick with small chunks of steel and aluminium. After a couple of minutes under the flame, the molten metal set up, uh, sent up an instant flash in what Brown says was, is the reaction that destroys the radioactivity. Now, I'm going to explain that as this. That's the old Brown there on uh, the right. The mild st steel catches the exotic vacuum objects on magnetic monopoles, and it allows them to aggregate. The aluminium melts at 660 degrees C, and it envelops the radioactive material iron matrix. Above 769 degrees C, the iron Curie temperature, the EVOs or magnetic monopole clusters are released from the mild steel and penetrate and eat into the aluminium and remediate the nuclear waste via atomic hydrogen bearing monopole intense thermitic like reaction. Um, so I, I, I believe that I have a very good understanding of, of what is going on. Now, uh, Ken Shoulder said monopole, uh, or rather EVOs can stay in uh, metals indefinitely. Two weeks after uh, Piantelli uh, had his most heat producing reactor in 1994, which produced 70 watts, he got the thing back from the nuclear authority and put it into a cloud chamber. And this is the point at which he observed these protons coming out. So this is running at the temperature of a cloud chamber, let's say minus 40 degrees C, and still it's ejecting high energy protons. I believe that there are monopole structures within it and that that is uh, still performing nuclear transmutations. And in, in the case of um, the Parkamov reaction tables, there are literally thousands of reactions where you have input nuclei and you end up with uh, protons uh, as a balancing equation uh, coming out. And, and as far as I'm concerned, they don't like to stay in there. They get spat out. And I think that's what's going on. And I've talked about Adamenko's work here as well, where he is also observing a structure cold after he's run the experiment where he's firing cesium 133 ions in and they are basically disappearing. So again, I think that this is uh, a case of uh, monopole stuck in the metal. Now, this brings me then to the Solin patterns. Basically, uh, Solin was using electron beam furnace uh, uh, and firing kinetic electrons accelerated in a high voltage electric field. And he says, spontaneously proceeding low temperature nuclear processes with the excitation of self-sustaining controlled chain reactions of nuclear fusion, functioning under conditions of combining electromagnetic, gravitational and nuclear interactions in a mass of nuclear fuel, generating directly in nuclear fuel, coherent radiation and superconducting currents of magnetically charged particles obtaining a superconducting nuclear material and a nuclear fusion product with the chemical elements formed in this process. So he is basically saying, this is the unification of the forces. This is what I believe is going on when you get sufficient intensity of the magnetic monopoles. He uses all paramagnetic materials. Uh, that's my uh, uh, para paramagnetic materials. That's my addition there. Uh, and he spec specifies it must have a low vapor pressure at its melting point. And this is so you can overload it with electrons. So you get electron bunching and, and can force coherence in, in, in the, the, it's not very well described. So he describes those uh, elements there. And certainly in the case of titanium and tungsten, I've experienced these things with the Mars gas uh, uh, falling apart and transmuting on a very readily ready basis. So over on the right, you've got the electron furnace there. A superconducting nuclear condensate is magnetic liquid metal nuclear fuel that generates energy 
with the generation of coherent radiation under conditions of nuclear phase transformations. Those are exactly the words in that 1992 news article. Under conditions of nuclear phase trans transformations in the mass of the initial product and the combination of electromagnetic, gravitational and nuclear interactions in it. Synthesis of elements from helium. Helium is uh, the uh, alpha particle. I'm saying it's alpha particle conjugates that you get out of these systems to iron and other heavy elements, in particular carbon. In particular carbon. He's already saying this in 1992. Nitrogen, oxygen, potassium, calcium, calcium, sodium, aluminium, magnesium, silicon, and iron. He says the process is accompanied by the occurrence of self-sustaining chain reactions with the participation in this process of composite particles of nuclei, protons, neutrons, external electrons, atoms, and other elementary particles inside the nuclei. Ultimately, as established by the author, a spontaneous process proceeds in the volume of the liquid bath of the metal, leading to its transition to a new aggregate state with the formation of superconducting, superfluid, nuclear substance, and the nucleation of magnetically charged particles in it. The physical result of the process becomes a recording device and detector, and this is where it really interests me. Magnetic charges that automatically arise and are maintained in its volume lead to the decay of protons and are catalysts for nuclear reactions. So if you've got pions coming out of your decayed protons, that's going to cause all kinds of local nuclear reactions to occur. With increasing, and, and this was observed by Matsumoto, when parts of uh, crystal grains within inside palladium actually disappeared and around the disappeared uh, uh, um, palladium grains, he actually had these transmutations. With increasing concentration of magnetic charges in the active medium, this intensity of course of nuclear reac uh, reactions increases spasmodically. This is achieved by creating conditions for self-compression of the mass of superconducting nuclear condensate. I've observed this self-compression in uh, uh, echo fuel, uh, where the, the, the structures are clustering to such an extent that they then collapse in on themselves. And this is quite similar to Matsumoto's NATO model, in my view. So, due to the formation of mobile active centers domains in the active medium, they have the form of hollow spheres and cylinders. And I know uh, Anatoly Klimov will have observed hollow spheres. I've observed hollow spheres. Inside them, nuclear fusion reactions occur. Magnetically contaminated particles are generated and accumulate with the generation of superconducting currents. Electromagnetic nuclear and gravitational forces are combined with the formation of coherent radiation. Active centers whose shells are composed of superconducting nuclear condensate rotate. This is very important for the end slides that I'm going to show you in a minute. They have a magnetic and gravitational field. Thus, active centers act as a gravimagnetic rotors in local zones. In the areas of their accumulation in the active medium for superconducting current, eddy currents, and circular waves with white glow, pulsations, and local explosions orderly direct, uh, directed self-accelerating mass flows in the form of cone and cylinder arise. Active centers interacting with each other move and join and then increase in their size. This process has a self-regulating and resonant character. Under such conditions, nuclear transformations spontaneously activate, propagating from central zones uh, of the liquid bath to its peripheral regions. Ultimately, conditions for explosive compression of the active medium in the operation of the reactor occur, and it talks about large domains there. Protrusions and depressions periodically occurring on its surface correspond to the maxima and minima of the intensity of a spontaneously generated alternating magnetic field and characterize the appearance of magnetic solitons of two different polarities in the resulting magnetic superconducting liquid. The physical processes in this substance are similar to those that occur in a superfluid, superconducting nuclear plasma, neutron stars. It obeys the laws of Bose condensate and acts as a Brilliant. classical Korean wave. Therefore, it is detected spontaneously without chemical etching of the nuclear fusion product due to the implementation of coherent, ultra-fast explosive crystallization. It consists of many fragments of dispersed areas in the form of ordered clusters of microcrystals, which are separated from each other by voids. I'm going to show you this in my view, which uh, I replicated in Japan last year. 2001 patent has far clearer scan, scan electron microscope images of strange radiation and other features. This is in his patent, and it shows many of the features that he observed 
in his reactor. These are the uh, various uh, different structures that he observed and he uh, uh, accounted for. Uh, it's a shame there's no SEMs, but in his 2001 patent, uh, where he looks at direct electricity generation, he actually uh, has many, many SEMs, but I'm not going to look at that now. I just want to look at some of the features here. So in the line reactor, we have uh, the uh, sort of floret features that we have, which are, in my view, very similar to the shoulders bead chains. And this is these magnetic clusters uh, self-organizing. And he also has this thing which he fixates on, which are these triangles. And we observe those triangles in many different cases in the Lion reactor. Uh, here are the uh, magnetohydrodynamic sort of uh, structures here. And uh, I've shown these earlier. And you can see that in the top left there, it specifically shows these things overlaying each other uh, exactly as has been observed in the Lion reactor. I believe that the Lion Reactor is able to produce all, if not most, of the features uh, of uh, the Solon Reactor, but for a few hundred dollars, uh, rather than having a large piece of industrial equipment. It is showing this uh, nuclear condensate process. This is in Amasa vibrator plates, and in the Solon pattern, you can see what I believe uh, is uh, the first uh, images of strange radiation put into the public sphere. And if you actually look at his 2001 patent, he actually has scanning electron microscopes of what he re was referring to, which are essentially strange radiation tracks. And to close out, I wanna show you something with a Mars gas, uh, which is explosive crystallization. And here we go. So what's happening in this is um, we are applying the gas to titanium, titanium being paramagnetic. I believe that the burning of the, t the, the uh, Mars gas is releasing both atomic hydrogen and monopole clusters, which are being trapped in the paramagnetic structure of the, um, the uh, titanium. And then this contacts as uh, polytetrafluoroethylene and you will see what happens. It's, it's had an instantaneous explosion. And the, the, the PTFE is on the left, the titanium is on the right. And here are these instantaneous crystals formed with voids, as described by Solin in 1992. And what I can tell you is that on this sample, there is all the alpha conjugate nuclei you can possibly imagine in plasmoids. And also some of these, uh, um, these, uh, dendrites, they have fibers coming off them and the fibers contain uh, uh, titanium with three alpha nuclei, then two alpha nuclei, then one alpha nuclei, and then it just runs out of uh, titanium and it's just put, it puts carbon down. And the reason is it can't put beryllium eight down uh, uh, and it can't alpha, it doesn't really matter. So you just end up with a carbon fiber stuck off the end of these things. My, my view is that um, uh, Solin's work was absolutely pioneering. I only came across his work in August, uh, and in the previous three years, I observed physical manifestations of this technology going on on a wide range of si systems that I've observed around the world and the samples that people have sent to me. I've just looked at things and I've gone, well, that's not right, or that's odd. And I've actually taken a macro image and then I've put it onto Google and I've not found a similar image anywhere on the internet. And so I'm thinking, well, this must be something interesting because no one else there has got an image like this. Well, actually, what I found is that Solon's sketches are sketches of the beautiful images in scanning electron microscopy, optical microscopy, and, and uh, 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 macro photography that I've been sharing over the last several years. And where his is a, a large, expensive Whoa, of equipment, um, you can see the same thing occurring in this re type of reactor here, which you can see here. This is uh, essentially you've got the, the reactor cores here with the iron bolt. Uh, you have in there the deut deuterated uh, nickel diamond pads here. Uh, and this, for me, demonstrates all of the uh, um, uh, signature of, of a quantum coherent reactor and it's for a few hundred dollars. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> it, it was very interesting.